Hello, and thank you for joining today, uh, the POCA Certification Academy, uh, for today's POCA SPICE webinar. The webinar is now beginning, so all lines have been muted. Please use the Q&A box for any questions or the chat box for comments you have throughout the webinar. Today's presentations will include a PowerPoint presentation and time for Q&A and answers. Uh, today's topic is musculoskeletal ultrasound of groin injuries, and our speaker is Dr. Mark Schmitz, who is also CEO and founder of Sonoskills. Welcome, Dr. Schmitz. We're so excited to hear you, and uh, we're so excited to see your presentation today. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you very much, Daria, and thank you for the POCUS Academy for inviting me to uh, speak to all of you all over the world. I heard that uh, uh, it's not only uh, taking place in the US at the moment, but many countries are tuning in. So that's really nice to, uh, to know. Uh, and uh, my name is Mark. Uh, as mentioned, I'm the founder of Sonoskills. And uh, my passion actually has, uh, for ultrasound, has grown uh, many years ago when I was in university and focusing uh, on uh, cadaveric anatomy, dissecting anatomy. And uh, after seeing a few years of anatomy, I, uh, I wanted to see it uh, uh, in real time. Um, uh, and I started to think, how can I visualize real time the human musculoskeletal system? And I started to work with ultrasound. And this became my passion. Sonar Skills uh, uh, was uh, created by me in 2010. And now at the moment, we're actually uh, training a lot of people all around the world, rheumatologists, radiologists, sonographers, sports physicians, um, uh, physical therapists, uh, uh, family doctors, so all kinds of uh, uh, experts. So uh, this is what we do. We do it in hands-on courses. We also do it online. So we also have an extensive online program. Uh, but uh, today we will start um, with uh, groin injuries. So I'll start up my presentation right now. And then um, we're going to talk about the wonders of this groin area because it's a quite a, a, a difficult area with uh, several um, uh, ways of looking at it and all those ways I'm going to describe you right now. So um, my introduction I partly already did. I, I talked about Sonar Skills, what we did. Uh, we also have a website, ultrasoundcases.info. It's free, uh, freely accessible to all of you. It contains uh, by now over 7,500 pathology cases in several domains. So uh, drop by and visit and learn, steepen your learning curve by looking at these free pathology cases. And my clinical work is actually based in the Laurentius Hospital in uh, Roermond, the Netherlands. That's my hometown, uh, Roermond. And there I work in the radiology department. Okay, so um, uh, looking at the groin uh, and, and groin injuries, uh, we know that we can look at several uh, potential uh, factors which uh, cause these uh, pains and um, or injuries. And these could be either adductor related, they could be iliopsoas related, they could be inguinal related, and they could also be pubic related. Uh, and adding to these four, they could also be hip joint related. So these four plus the hip joint makes five. Uh, these we are going to touch uh, on today. So in 2015, there was this uh, consensus statement called the DOA agreement meeting on the terminology and definitions of groin pain, because there were lots of definitions about groin pain. Um, and uh, it was a kind of an umbrella term for, and this was a, a polluted term. So they made a, a proper definition in these meetings. And uh, this presentation is also based on those agreements. So let us first talk about the adductor related groin pain, which is pain, um, uh, uh, of course, caused by the adductors. And uh, then in this, case, there's clinical signs of adductor tenderness and also pain on resisted adduction testing. So let's uh, jump straight to the uh, anatomy. Uh, that's what uh, uh, you're, you're here for. You're all sonoholics, uh, passionate professionals wanting to learn more about it. 
And we're going to place the patient in uh, supine, uh, placing the leg in an adduction external rotation. And I'm going to palpate uh, the, with my fingers uh, uh, the, the tendon. And the spot uh, where uh, the, the tendon is most prominent to feel, I'm going to place the transducer on and following the tendon all the way to its origin on the pubic bone. And this is the sonar anatomical image uh, which we see. And um, looking at the uh, muscles, this is the adductor longus, the adductor magnus, uh, uh, adductor brevis, uh, the adductor magnus, and all these come together uh, to a conjoint tendon, one tendon originating from the pubic bone. So uh, you can see a smooth uh, pubic bone. So this is what we uh, check for, how regular or irregular the bone actually is. And looking at the uh, tendon of the conjoint tendon, uh, how um, healthy it is, what's the, the, the thickness, the shape, uh, is, is it thickened, is it thinning? Uh, how is the echogenicity, hypochoic, mixed echogenicity, maybe even anechoic eh, in case of tearing, um, or is it a healthy tendon? And then we have these homogeneous, uh, homogenic, uh, uh, echo, uh, hypochoic uh, color. Um, and of course, looking to the musculotendinous junction, which is uh, right there, very important. And also looking to this structure right there, which is also partly tendinous. And I will explain this after this slide. Um, so uh, placing the transducer here, you really want to go far up to the pubic bone to see every part of the uh, uh, tendon uh, origin. Uh, so you really need to place the towel of the patient a little bit to the side to really go up onto the pubic bone. Don't feel, don't feel uh, uncomfortable with going to this intimate zone. Explain the patient in advance, but you really want to go there. As if you're not going to do it, you will miss pathology because most pathology can actually be found on top of the pubic bone right there. So you really want to check for that. Um, so uh, this is uh, the uh, tendon origin uh, in this schematic drawing. And then you can see what I already mentioned, the adductor longus, the brevis and the magnus, inserting or originating from this, uh, this conjoint tendon. Here we can see the musculotendinous uh, uh, yeah, transitional zone. And you can see that this tendon on top of the adductor longus runs quite deeply to distal. So there's a long tendon and long musculotendon junction with this adductor longus. So like mentioned, if you wanna see the origin, really go far up onto the pubic bone and don't stay in one spot. So go far on top of the pubic bone, but then also scan the whole origin from proximal to distal to see every bit of the tendon before you go towards the musculotendon junction and then the uh, the uh, muscles. This is a pathology image, and uh, this pathology image clearly shows a problem with the adductor longus, the most superficial adductor. Uh, we can see that the fibular pattern, which can be seen here quite well, uh, cannot be seen right there. This is due to this large defect uh, inside the muscle. Uh, we can see a, a anechoic zone. There's no connection of fibers anymore. And um, uh, so uh, there is a disruption of fibers and these are being retracted. And with this retraction, you get a loss of fibular pattern uh, and this whole change of echogenicity there. So this is quite a severe uh, muscle, adductor longus muscle tear. Same thing here. Uh, we can see uh, that the, the muscular pattern has been disrupted also in this adductor longus. Uh, we can also see that the fibular pattern again has been uh, changed. There's also retraction of fibers, and there's also large tearing of the uh, AD Dr. Longus. This is uh, an um, AD Dr. problem scanned in time uh, day one, day three, day five or six or seven, but a few days, uh, a week later, a little bit less than a week later. And then we can see that it's not a problem within the, the tendon, uh, within the muscle. Uh, it's also not a problem directly of the tendon, but it's actually the musculotendinous junction, which is uh, quite dark and which has been torn. And this gap increases over the days where fluid collection is being uh, yeah, accumulated 
Um, and uh, yeah, in this case, you also can see that most musc of a lot of musculoskeletal problems that become more prominent over uh, a few days after the trauma when these fluids are accumulating. So um, yeah, this can clearly be seen here. We don't see any connection of fibers. It's total anechoic, it's fluid. Okay, I've got a poll question for you. Um, so in this slide, we see a, uh, yeah, a image. Um, and the question is, this uh, adductor is partially torn. The tear is located uh, and you uh, cho choose one thing, either tenderness, muscular tenderness or muscular. So please your um, answers. We have about 40% people responded, so we'll give a little bit more time. Yes, is it tenderness, muscular tenderness, or muscular? Okay. Okay, 10 more seconds. Yes, and then I'm going to enlighten you. I'm ending the poll and here are the results. Okay, muscular tenderness has the most uh, option of, or the most uh, answers or the, the, the highest statistics. And this is actually the uh, correct uh, answer. So thank you for that. And let me explain why. Uh, of course, clearly here, the, um, uh, the, yeah, the, the, the tear can be seen within the... Um, let me check if I can close this uh, poll area. Yeah, thank you. Um, so here the, uh, the tear can be seen, but we also notice that the upper boundary of the adductor longus is uh, tenderness. So this is also uh, yeah, being part of the pathology and this is a muscular tenderness tear. Good. So, Mm, let me see, how does it work? Go to the next slide, yes. Um, so that's a little bit about the AD doctors. So if we're looking at the next uh, possible uh, reason for groin pains, um, we can look at the pubic uh, area and the pubic synthesis may be tender uh, upon uh, palpation, um, but yeah, it's difficult to test with resistance testings. Uh, you cannot provoke uh, these yeah, specific, uh, these pubic uh, pains, uh, but yeah, you can palpate and also sonopalpate with the transducer and also look with your uh, transducer. Um, and if we scanning the uh, pubic bone, then um, we can see the joint, the pubic uh, symphysis right here, and the pubic symphysis has a certain width. Uh, and look that the width decreases uh, once uh, the depth is increasing. Uh, so it's more narrow into uh, the depth. And then we have the ligament here, the superior pubic uh, ligament. And this ligament uh, also stabilizes the pubic bone. The ligament also has a certain thickness. So this is the thickness of the ligament and this is the width of the joint. And in this case, uh, we can see that um, the uh, pubic bone uh, it has looks a little bit wider. Uh, so the, the, there, there seems to be an increase width of uh, the joint itself. Uh, we can also see that the ligament is a little bit more stretched. Usually it has a little bit of a convexity, a little bit round, but upon uh, widening of the joint, it tightens and it flattens uh, the, uh, the ligament. And uh, in this case, in this image, we can see clearly that there is a disposition of the, uh, the joint and the, therefore it's also increasing in width and flattening the, uh, the ligament. And this is a severe trauma. We can see that there is a fracture in this pelvic area and this widens the uh, pubic bone uh, of the pubic, the pubic joint, the, uh, the pubic symphysis, uh, yeah, a great deal, huh? a lot, and we can see widening of the joints 
uh, with one bone here and one actually some somewhere over there. So this is, a, of course, a real uh, problem. Uh, this is a normal joint on the left side. Uh, we can see a affected joint. The affected uh, pubic symphysis uh, has a little bit of irregularity of the bone. And sometimes you see this once the adductor uh, muscles, which originate from the, uh, the pubic bone, are actually also pulling at the bone. You have these little antisophytes, sometimes these little avulsion uh, uh, fractures or lesions. Um, uh, but in this case, we, we also can see that the uh, superior pubic ligament has increased in thickness clearly. Um, and this may have to do not only with the ligament, but also with uh, the adductor muscles, which, which also have a connection with this, uh, this ligament, uh, but also the, um, uh, the, the abdominal muscles, which also uh, insert to this uh, ligament and to this pubic bone. So this pubic symphysis is actually a, 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 a central point, which uh, is a junction of abdominal muscles inserting to this region and adductor muscles inserting to this region. And if they pull, then this whole pubic symphysis can also be uh, affected. Here again, we can see these uh, irregularities uh, of the bone. Um, so this is uh, some degenerative changes, also some, some overuse changes by either the rectus abdominis or by the uh, uh, adductor uh, tendon, uh, the adductor tendon. So uh, these changes in many cases correlate with, with um, yeah, clinical relevant symptoms of uh, the patient. So uh, another um, uh, region which um, uh, is, is contributing to uh, groin pains in general uh, is the, uh, the hip joint. Um, and we know that the hip joint has uh, uh, yeah, a lot of structures uh, surrounding it. Um, but, but let's now focus really on the hip joint, uh, the acetabulum, the uh, femoral head, the capsule around it. And uh, yeah, pain from this hip joint should always be considered as a potential cause of groin pain. And um, yeah, sometimes it's, it's hard to distinguish from other causes and it may coexist with other types of groin pain. So don't only look for this fluid in the hip joint capsule, but also be prepared that uh, other uh, yeah, reasons of pain, causes of the pain may be present. So for example, a hip joint plus a iliopsoas problem or a hip joint plus a uh, adductor problem. So we are going to place the transducer in, um, in, um, in, in, in line, in long axis of the femoral neck. Um, and then we're going to uh, image the, uh, the hip joint um, in a longitudinal way. If you cannot find it like this, uh, you, we have a bony prominence uh, right there. This is the superior ili um, uh, anterior iliac spine. Uh, with the transducer, the proximal tip of the transducer, you can start right there in this placing the transducer right here, and then uh, uh, slowly um, following the inguinal ligament to uh, medial, and at one point in the depth, if you adjust your uh, settings correctly, you will see uh, automatically the hip joint. But after practicing this for a few times, you will see that uh, you go straight away to the hip joint and, can't, uh, and definitely can find it. So uh, this is the, um, the, the anatomy, sonoanatomy of the hip joint. We can see the uh, acetabulum, uh, we can see the uh, labrum, uh, we can also see the capsule inserting to the, uh, to the femoral neck. So this is the femoral neck, uh, and here we can see the femoral head. Um, the femoral head is covered uh, with, uh, of course, with uh, hyaline cartilage. So this cartilage can be observed right there. Um, and there's always a little bit of a physiological fluid uh, in this recess right there uh, between bone and capsule. So this is normal, but definitely check there for larger fluid collections because in case of hip joints, 
problems or in synovitis or atritis uh, or other problems, a hip of these effusions might accumulate right there. We also look how smooth the bone is, how round the um, uh, femoral head is. If there are any interruptions, for example, a fracture, uh, maybe in the head or maybe in this part of the neck uh, might be there. And uh, what I always do is also don't look from a static point of view, but also dynamically. So maneuvering the leg of the patient in an internal and external rotation uh, so that you can see more of the femoral head as possible. You need to go to, uh, in this case, to five centimeters of depth. But if people have a, a higher BMI, uh, more um, uh, subcutaneous fat tissue, then uh, you need to increase your depth. Um, and this might lose you some, uh, so some, 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 some visual, uh, visualization on the anatomy. So in that case, you can uh, either um, work with your frequency, of course, or uh, make a trapezoid view, artificial trapezoid view with a linear transducer, or you can go uh, and choose for a curvy linear transducer with a lower frequency to see more in the, in the depth. So if you see a lot of hips, that might be a great addition uh, to your system. Uh, we can also look uh, at the hip joints from a, a transverse view and short axis, and then turning the transducer to a short axis. Uh, we can see the female head again, we can see the highland cartilage, we can see the uh, hip capsule there, uh, reinforced with the iliofemoral ligament. And we can see, of course, the ventral hip muscles um, um, yeah, in this, uh, in this area. And beautifully, whilst do it uh, dynamically, you can see the, the rolling of the, the, the hip, um, the head of the hip, the female head inside uh, its, uh, its capsule. So this is a uh, article uh, from Sconfianza and others, or a table from an article of Sconfianza and others, which I use a lot. Uh, Sconfianza and others in 2017 or 18, they, with 19 radiologists, they came together and made a consensus which injuries can be scanned with ultrasound and to which degree. Um, so this is what they uh, show, what, what they decided on. Um, and a score of three means uh, ultrasound is the preferred imaging tool um, uh, to, to use for this uh, specific pathology. Uh, two is it's equal to other medical imaging techniques, like for example, MRI. One is um, it's not, uh, you can use it if uh, others are not appropriate as a first choice. Uh, and grade zero is actually, it's not, ultrasound is not indicated. And if we look to fluid uh, detection in the hip joint, it scores actually a three, meaning that, um, yeah, ultrasound is the tool uh, to screen for fluids around the hip joint. Uh, looking at uh, osteotritis is, is um, scoring a zero uh, because we cannot see intraarticular with, uh, the, um, the, uh, uh, with the ultrasound. But uh, I think that uh, in clinical practice, especially if you work in primary care and you don't have any tools uh, to look uh, intraarticularly, for example, X-ray or MRI or CTs, then uh, and you only have access to ultrasound, you definitely can see some changes within osteotritis. I'm also going to show you a few examples, uh, but please know that there are limitations to it. Uh, synovitis, uh, effusion, synovial problems or labral cysts, ultrasound scores are three. Uh, labor problems are a little bit difficult, so I would refrain from, by of making harsh statements about labral tearing. Uh, Anabasitis scores a two, so it's yeah, easy to see abasitis with ultrasound imaging. So uh, this is the synovitis scores uh, already proposed in 2006. Um, and um, you, yeah, you can use it to grade actually uh, fluid collections within the hip joint. Um, I showed you that the um, capsule uh, should run all the way to the uh, femoral neck with uh, underneath a little bit of fluid, but the capsule should have a concavity right there. So it should be uh, like this. And that's called, that's normal, and this is a grade zero. If there is a little bit of uh, a fluid accumulation, well, more, then 
uh, this capsule will tighten a bit and will become more straight. So this concavity will turn into a straight line. That's a grade one. With a grade two, there is uh, more uh, fluid collection and the uh, capsule is actually being pushed up. So this distance, this distance increases a lot. That's a grade two. And with a grade three, you don't see a concavity of the capsule, but actually a convexity of the capsule. And of course, also this distance increases a lot and that's a grade three. So this is um, again, uh, also the, uh, this checklist from uh, 2006 but now scoring an osteophyte, so in case of degeneration osteoarthritis, and we're looking at the how smooth the bone actually is, and this is really uh, smooth, so that's normal, that's a grade zero. This is a grade one, we see small irregularity changes uh, to the bone, uh, so um, uh, in grade two, we see more irregular irregularities, um, some osteophytes irregularities, and in grade three, it's it's even more. So um, you definitely can see that with osteophytes and osteo osteoarthritis, uh, yeah, you, you can see it. What you can visualize, you can see. Uh, but please know that what happens in the depth, in the joint itself, right there, is a little bit difficult to see. And yeah, we cannot make harsh statements about that. Here we can see uh, a labrum uh, pathology. Uh, here we can see this, uh, this normal labrum. Um, so uh, although uh, a labrum scores in the Sconfianza table I showed you earlier scored actually a zero, um, but um, uh, yeah, in this case, we can see clearly that there is a problem. This is normal triangular shaped labrum, uh, nice hyperechoic, but in this case, this labrum is going to thicken because inside the labrum is a cyst and we can see this anechoic uh, fluid in longitudinal long axis and in transverse in a short axis. So if it's that clear, you definitely can make a statement about the, um, the finding, but yeah, the preferred imaging tool in case of a liberal cyst is still, um, um, yeah, maybe not uh, ultrasound. Here we can see a, a bursa, uh, the iliopsoas bursa. The fluid collection is outside the joint, so it's extra articular. Uh, this is the joint capsule. Earlier, we, we looked at uh, the fluid collections between capsule and bone. Is it convex? Is it straight? Is it, um, uh, th is it uh, con uh, co uh, sorry, concave, straight, or convex? Uh, but this fluid collection clearly is outside the capsule. It's underneath the iliopsoas. So this is a iliopsoas bursitis. This is a clear fluid and echoic. I see some, some small thickening of the bursal wall, some proliferative changes, but uh, not that much. And this is the same bursa in uh, transverse and short axis. Looking at how smooth the bone is, not only for ossifieds, but also fractures. So in this case, we can see a fracture of uh, the femoral head. Um, uh, so increasingly, ultrasound is also being used to screen, especially in primary care, for fractures. And um, yeah, so ultrasound, uh, you cannot see in the depth what kind of fracture it is, but if there is an interruption of the bone, you can send people in for an X-ray um, and reduce the, uh, uh, the false uh, positives or the X-rays, which are actually not uh, necessary, uh, not necessary to make. Um, so the hip joint can also result, especially in the athlete population, in a cam, uh, cam or pincer. Um, um, uh, impingement, a femoral acetabular impingement. So we can see that uh, in uh, the first uh, case uh, with a cam, uh, the, the, um, or a pincer, the, um, the acetabulum is actually enlarged. But in this case, uh, the cam um, uh, change lesion, then actually the uh, round, the concave shape, the transition zone between the um, uh, female head towards the female neck uh, has uh, changed. 
it's not as concave anymore, but it has flattened and sometimes to a large degree. And if a, pa a patient makes a movement, a flexion or an abduction, then there is uh, a bone to bone contact and the patient is limited. Um, and uh, this causes also pain. Um, when scanning the hip joint, again, we want to see this curvature which transitions in this femoral neck, but, uh, and we can measure it uh, by um, um, making, yeah, I won't go into detail of the measurement right now. It's uh, maybe a little bit com complex, but you can measure the, uh, the alpha angle. And if the alpha angle is uh, less than uh, 60 or 55 degrees, uh, this is okay, but if it increases the alpha angle, this is an indication that there might be a femoral acetabular impingement. And this is an example of, we want to see the round shape of the femoral head with this concave uh, shape right here, which is the femoral neck. But in this case, uh, we can see clearly a flattening of the bone and there is no uh, concavity right there. And of course, this results in, uh, in problems of uh, the patient. And yeah, we, in this case, we don't have to need to make a measurement as it's already clear on, uh, yeah, visually. Uh, and in this case, we can also see that uh, the round shape has decreased. Uh, there is a spur right there. If a, a pistol grip, this is also called a flattening of the, um, the femoral neck to head transition zone. Okay, so I have a poll question again for you. Ultrasound is the preferred imaging tool to assess synovitis of the hip joint. Is this true or false? Gives me the time to take a sip of water. And please know that um, um, uh, on sonoskills.com, you can find much more information about the, uh, the hip joint. Uh, previous month, uh, we did uh, a whole uh, series of lectures, three lectures of 90 minutes, discussing everything there's to know about the hip joint. This is only a small part of those uh, lectures. And uh, the recordings of those lectures can actually be found on sonoskills.com. And uh, uh, yeah, you, you can learn everything there's to know about advanced scanning of the hip joint. Okay. Is this true statement? Yes or no? Yes, this is a true statement. Well done. Um, ultrasound is indeed the preferred imaging tool to assess synovitis. Let me see. Yeah. Okay, I just want to point out to uh, sonoskills.com, our website. Um, on sonoskills.com, you can find uh, not only our course schedule, where it might be something uh, hands-on uh, near you, because we're active in many countries, but we also have a great uh, online schedule, uh, future webinars or a series of lectures. Uh, we have a great program coming up for 2022 every month, uh, a few webinars. Uh, but we also did in the past year, a lot of webinars, which we have uh, recorded. So um, if you want to visit them, uh, feel free to go to sonoskill.com. If you want to be approached by us, uh, uh, drop uh, your email address in this section of the newsletter, and we can inform you every month on the upcoming webinars. And if you want to have a Black Friday deal, which is also coming up Black Friday at the end of the month, uh, drop uh, or visit also this button because uh, we have a nice uh, offer to you. Um, so looking at uh, the iliopsoas related groin pain, um, is iliopsoas tenderness uh, and maybe also some pain or resisted hip flexion uh, or when stretching uh, the, the hip flexors. And when scanning the iliopsoas, we can do it in transfer section right there um, and, and scan from proximal to distal uh, in this short axis view. And this is what we actually see. So this is uh, the uh, iliac crest. We can see the iliac psoas, uh, the lateral fibers of the, uh, of the iliacus muscle, sorry, the iliacus muscles. We can see the medial fibers of the iliacus muscle. And there we can see the psoas major tendon. And these together, they uh, will turn into the iliac psoas uh, muscle. 
And the iliopsoas is on top uh, of the, um, uh, the hip joint. Uh, please know that, uh, yeah, you need to scan then a little bit more towards medial. If you go too much to lateral, then the overlying muscle is not the iliopsoas anymore, but will be the rectus femoris. And this is again the article I mentioned uh, of uh, Scanfianza and others. And we know that um, the uh, uh, anterior tendinopathy can sc be scored with a two uh, or psoas um, tendon pathology. In 2012, they said one, but in 2017, they changed it to a two. So psoas tendon pathology can definitely be scanned with uh, ultrasound. Here we can see a psoas major tendon uh, or tendinosis. We can see compared to the healthy side, the increase of cross-sectional area. So this is a swelling, uh, but the uh, tendon still looks, uh, has integrity. Uh, the fibers are still intact and have continuity. So this is a tendinosis. And sometimes this tendinosis can have really strange causes. So in this case, with this uh, total hip implant, uh, there is a loosening of the cup or the cup is not, has not been implanted as deep as uh, it should. And we see a friction of the iliopsoas um, um, uh, muscle over this uh, uh, little rim of uh, the, uh, the cup of the implant. So and yeah, sometimes you, uh, you can see that. We can also looking at uh, snapping of the hip, uh, extra-articular snapping or intra-articular snapping. Please know that ultrasound is the preferred imaging tool for extra-articular snapping, but intra-articular snapping we cannot do because uh, with ultrasound, intra-articular structures are uh, hard to, uh, to check. So if you want to uh, check uh, for, for extra-articular iliopsoas snapping, then you can bring the leg into a flexion, bring it to a deduction, and then uh, extend uh, the, uh, the uh, leg again. And this really provokes the iliopsoas tendon and gives actually a snap. And uh, this snapping might be painful in some patients. Uh, and what happens actually then? So I have a clip uh, for you to, uh, to show. Um, so this is the transverse uh, iliopsoas. Uh, this is the, uh, the iliacus muscle, and this is uh, the tendon. And this tendon uh, is snapping around uh, against the, the, the bone, actually. So there it snaps again. So let me show it again. Follow this uh, oval shape right there. It's going up right here, and then it's being released, and it snaps against the bone. And this uh, is uh, a snapping, and this person is not uh, that it was uh, that painful. So it's still no, not many changes uh, to the uh, to the tendon. Uh, but if it happens a lot and repetitive, uh, you can definitely see changes in the long run. So repetitive uh, friction, which might lead to an inflammation, and then in time the tendon becomes hypochoic and enlarged. And uh, this becomes a vicious circle because this tendon then snaps easier. And okay, so you need to intervene uh, with that. And uh, please also know that there is a correlation between snapping of the ellipsoas and enlargement of the bursa. And um, yeah, so if you see a bursa, also check at, please the ellipsoas for snapping. Okay, and the last point is actually is inguinal uh, or inguinal related groin pain. Um, so that's uh, in the inguinal canal. And, and this, uh, we can see some, uh, some hernias right there. And uh, uh, inguinal hernia is actually a protrusion of abdominal content into the inguinal area. And um, yeah, I know that a lot of people of you, uh, they wanna know how to scan this. Uh, and I have to say that I don't do it that much anymore. I did it in the past, but I do it less nowadays because research has actually shown that the diagnosis of groin areas is primarily made by clinical examination. And definitely you can scan it uh, and visualize it, uh, but especially in cases, it, it makes sense to do it in cases of uncertainty and then sonographers uh, sonography offers a value, but if it's clear on, upon clinical uh, examination, that's actually the best method and you don't need to do a, a scan anymore. 
There are two types of hernias. We have an indirect hernia and we have a direct hernia. The indirect hernia, uh, uh, I will explain in a minute, um, has a 50% uh, prevalence. Uh, it's mostly right-sided, men more than women. And you see that men, it's mostly congenital because of a weak spot in the, in the deep ring. I will explain in a minute on, on an anatomy image. And then we have the direct hernia, which is more often in older people and uh, the, yeah, mostly due to weakening of abdominal and pelvic floor muscles. Okay, so how, what is a hernia and where does it take place? So looking at the abdominal muscles, the oblique ones, we've got the uh, obliquus externus, the uh, obliquus internus, and the transverse abdominus. And then we have the transverse uh, fascia right there. And um, there is an opening in this uh, transverse uh, fascia. Um, and this is actually the deep ring, deep ring. And then there is a canal, so the inguinal canal, which goes all the way to medial, to more to superficial, and it opens uh, uh, near the pubic bone, and there we can find the superficial ring. And the, the uh, canal actually contains the, in men, the uh, spermatic cord, and in women, the ligamentum teres. So uh, if there is a um, indirect hernia, then abdominal content is actually pushing inside uh, this deep ring right there. So going into this, uh, uh, this, 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 this canal. So uh, that's a indirect hernia. So if you have a direct hernia, then actually the hernia is located more towards medial and it's not herniating within um, the, 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 the the, the tunnel, uh, the, the canal, but it's herniating more medially. And the boundary of medial or lateral, direct or indirect hernia is actually these vessels right there. So these are the inferior epigastric vessels. So if you see the vessels and it's located medially to it, then it's a, uh, a direct hernia. If it's located medially or laterally to it, then it's actually a indirect hernia. So uh, these vessels, they are actually a, um, yeah, a, um, a, a landmark to, um, uh, to, yeah, to screen for either direct or indirect hernia. How can we find them? You can scan the uh, short axis of the, uh, uh, the rectus abdominis muscle. And then uh, at one point you will see next to the rectus abdominis muscle, this uh, inferior epigastric uh, artery. And you can follow the artery until the point where you have this uh, inguinal uh, ligament. And near to that, you will see the deep inguinal uh, ring. So again, indirect hernia is located right there. And the direct hernia is located in Hesselsbach triangle, which is actually the location between rectus abdominis muscle, inguinal uh, uh, ligament, and also the inferior epigastric uh, artery. So uh, there is also another way in scanning it. Uh, we can also start uh, by looking at the pubic bone and the spermatic cord right there and transverse. And then we can follow the spermatic cord up to uh, proximal, here it is, and then turn the transducer to longitudinal and we can see the spermatic cord going inside the inguinal canal. So that's also a, a possibility. And we can also measure the thickness of the spermatic cord because in uh, men, right, men, uh, the spermatic cord is often thickened in case of a hernia. So looking at the clinical examination, we know that uh, the, the, the accuracy, the sensitivity and specificity is, uh, is quite high. Um, so, uh, and, we, and uh, over in, in clinical examination is quite high. And here we can see the uh, measures for ultrasound examination. And um, to reduce the cost of healthcare, to uh, don't do um, yeah, assessments which are actually not needed to burden the patient, it's best uh, to, um, uh, to first stick to clinical examination. But uh, if that doesn't help, if this doesn't give you the, uh, the conclusions you need, you can go to ultrasound examination. Uh, or if you want to know which type it is, or what's the location, or is it reducible, 
uh, or uh, suspicion of an occult hernia, you can definitely use uh, ultrasound for that. So here we can see a, um, uh, a direct uh, hernia. This is the access to the inguinal uh, canal. These are the inferior epigastric uh, arteries. And we can see that medially uh, to, the, um, to, the, uh, to the arteries, it's not inside the canal. It's medially pushing up like a mushroom cloud. Like, uh, and this is a direct hernia. And in this case, it's a indirect hernia. We can see that uh, the uh, hernia is going into the canal lateral to the epigastric artery. So um, here we can see the, uh, the arteries. Here we can see the rectus abdominis muscle in transverse. And right there is a, um, so meaning that this is Hesselsbach triangle. And within Hesselsbach triangle, we can see this direct hernia. And if the patient is being uh, stressed or Vazalva maneuver, blowing on the back of the hand, uh, this, uh, this hernia pops up like a mushroom cloud and meaning that this is a direct hernia. If you don't see anything with stressing in a supine and the patient, for example, uh, Vasalva maneuver, you can do it again in the standing position. And then uh, this gives extra load and functional load. And sometimes you can see it much better uh, in, in this. Actually, you should do it in that way. So if, if it's negative, you always should do it also in standing position. So coughing is actually not needed because it's too quick and you cannot see with a high reliability whether there is a, a hernia. So you need, really need to blow the, on the back of your hand uh, to, uh, to see it. Uh, same thing, uh, we can see, a, uh, we can see the, um, the, the hernia and while stressing the hernia with the Vasalva maneuver, we can see this, this blob uh, uh, of uh, the, 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 yeah, the hernia. Again, this, here we can see the inferior epigastric arteries. Um, here we can see the hernia and the rectus abdominis. And while making a, um, a Vasalva maneuver, we can see an enlargement of the, uh, yeah, of the inguinal uh, groin area. And last slide is actually that um, here we can see the spermatic cord and the spermatic cord should have a certain thickness. This is a normal case. But in this uh, case, we can see that it's uh, quite enlarged, quite thickened, also becoming more hypochoic. And uh, this you all can also see in uh, these groin injuries or groin um, inguinal uh, uh, hernias. Okay, so a question to you, a indirect hernia is located medial to the epigastric inferior artery. Is this true or false? So, Leaves me to say that if you want to prepare for your POCUS examination, uh, go to cernoskills.com because we have so many courses and, and, and webinars and lectures to offer. This is a great preparation for you to, uh, prepare, yeah, to prepare for your POCUS examination. So uh, we know that we successfully helped a lot of uh, people who were certified uh, and, and in the past. And uh, yeah, they said that it was all great tools for, pre for preparing. Okay, so let's um, have a look at the uh, true or false. Um, so most people actually said false, but it's a lot of people still said true, but false B is actually the correct answer. Well done, guys. The majority said the correct answer. It's actually located laterally to the uh, epigastric uh, inferior artery. And the direct hernia is located in Hesselsbach triangle, which is located medially. Okay, so um, each time after a question, my PowerPoint, yeah, blocks, but now it works again. Um, so he, what we discussed today is that if a patient has a groin injury, Please think of the adductors, the iliopsoas, the inguinal area, the pubic area, and also adding to that the hip joint. But uh, also know that um, uh, there are many other causes of groin pains in athletes. Some of them can be scanned with ultrasound. A lot of them cannot be scanned with ultrasound. You need to refer the patient. So it's good to know 
uh, that uh, there is much more to it. And we, today we discuss actually only this. So it's a difficult area and it's an interesting area. There's so much to learn and this makes our profession also beautiful because you never stop learning. I want to thank you for uh, today. We still have a live Q&A coming up, so stay tuned. I just want to point out that after the webinar, if you have any questions, send an email to mark at sonaskills.com. Uh, I can help you with that. Uh, and you can also follow our show or send me a direct message on LinkedIn or let's get connected on LinkedIn. And you can also follow our socials where we share on a weekly basis the latest evidence in musculoskeletal ultrasound. Okay, so that's uh, it for, uh, for me. So I'm going to stop sharing the presentation and go back to Daria. Thank you so much. Uh, this was great. Tons of new information, I'm sure our um, participants have a lot of questions, so I will just get started. So the first question was, uh, what is the normal intrapubic distance? So um, actually, I don't know. Um, the, uh, and let me also say why. Um, uh, we did a lot of uh, measurements in the past and we, we, we taught them and we also have a book and we, in, in the book, we, we, we listed all the measurements, but uh, once in time, yeah, once uh, getting more experience in certain regions, uh, I saw that, uh, I noticed that it's, yeah, the intra reliability, the inter reliability, reliability of measuring uh, is not always that uh, that good in ultrasound. This makes also ultrasound. That's a weak point of of ultrasound. It's highly operator dependent, and uh, I also noticed that um, yeah, in research, it's not always the correct uh, the correct measurements. So um, uh, what I actually am doing as I'm, I'm still measuring certain uh, certain tendons, for example, at supraspinatus tendon. Uh, or Achilles tendon or patella tendon, I exactly know the measurements and I also use them. But in this particular case, I've seen a huge deal of variety between people, uh, but also a problem of st uh, standardizing the measurements that I don't use it in uh, the pubic area. Great, thank you so much. Uh, the second question is, what is the role of sonography during pubic fracture? What do we look for when there is an obvious displaced fractures in X-ray? Yeah, so uh, if you have a pubic fracture, uh, I think that uh, most people will uh, end up uh, in the hospital um, and uh, a lot of, uh, and then I would say that the, the preferred imaging tool is not uh, ultrasound, uh, but sometimes in the emergency room, uh, people want to have a quick question or a quick yes or no uh, 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 answer uh, in focus, a quick screening. And with this, uh, you, um, you can uh, place the transducer on top of uh, the pubic synthesis and see immediately if it's uh, widened and if it's widened uh, and, or at this position, then you know that there should be somewhere a fracture. So if you wanna check this yes or no question, check for um, a widening of the pubic uh, area or a displacement of the uh, pubic synthesis. This already gives you a clue that there might be something severe going on. Uh, in sport, sports athletes, uh, of course, you look for more for the regularity of the bone. Uh, and uh, if the joint is close together in a normal anatomical position, but a roughening of the bone, it's more of a tenderness problem instead of a fracture or a disposition. Thank you so much. Um, the next question is, how much movement of the spermatic cord is normal during Valsava? How much, how much movement uh, of the spermatic cord? Uh, so during uh, the Valsava maneuver, I'm actually looking at uh, the, uh, the, 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 the hernia, which is abdominal uh, content. And this movement cannot be uh, standardized. It's not measurable. Uh, what you're looking actually is, uh, is this, uh, this, this zone, this hyperchloric zone, is it enlarging during a Vasalva uh, maneuver? Um, and if you see that it's increasing, then uh, this is already a clear sign of a inguinal hernia. Okay, thank you. And the last question I have in Q&A, is there any vessel in hernia content rather than fat and bowel? Is there any other content you said? 
Her hernia. Yeah, so in case, so as, as I understood the question, so what's the content actually of the hernia, right? And is it yes. intestines or is it, uh, yeah. So uh, as I understood, it's, uh, it's abdominal content, it's mostly intestines. Um, and uh, I think that this one is uh, protruding in areas where it shouldn't be. Think of the, uh, the uh, indirect hernia, which goes into the canal. In the canal, we also have the spermatic cord. Uh, so we have the uh, uh, intestines and the abdominal content into the uh, canal next to the spermatic cord. But in a direct hernia, outside the, um, uh, the, 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 the inguinal canal, the spermatic cord is in a totally different spot. Uh, it's, in the, it's in the canal and this intestines and this direct hernia is right uh, uh, yeah, medial in Hesselsbach triangle. So, so you should not think that the hernia is the spermatic cord, the spermatic or the hernia is actually intestines and abdominal content pushing outwards. And the last one just came in. I am not sure how specific the question is. It just says, could you please explain about femoral hernia? So if you can comment on that or maybe we can connect the speaker with the question. Uh, Femoral hernia. Uh, so we have femoral acetabular impingement, or we have an inguinal hernia. Um, so uh, this speaker can um, uh, send me an email to mark at sonyskills.com and then we can uh, get uh, connected. Perfect. Thank you so much, Dr. Schmitz. I, I have just one last poll for the audience. Um, and I just wanted to say thank you so much uh, for this great presentation. It's a lot of information. I'm sure people will reach out to you with any questions that they have left. And um, just wanted to remind this webinar was recorded and will be available within a week. And you will get a reminder from us with the instructions on how to access the webinar. And I also wanted to mention that we also, as POCO Certification Academy, has a uh, special deal on Cyber Monday, and all our certificates and uh, certifications will be 50% off. So you feel free to reach out to us and um, buy those, and if you would like to get certified, especially in this field of MSK. So it's a good deal. It only happens. Good deal. <laughs> so, um, uh, but yes, so if you have any questions, thank you so much again for joining us today. And we hope to see you in the next webinar series um, uh, next year. So thank you so much. Have a nice uh, day or evening, whatever you are. <laughs> thank you so thank much you. as well. Thank you.